Check, check. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Off Axis Podcast. I'm here with Julian and William. William is the last person to do my taxes last year. Thank you for that. No problem. And Julian, you're his business partner, correct? Correct. So you guys are CPAs, right? Can you explain what your business is? Yeah, we're a Bellar CPAs, a full service CPA firm providing uh, small business bookkeeping and tax services. Um, our base is primarily athletes and construction. Sweet. So if you guys need your taxes done, these guys are the people to hit up. Um, I'm actually super excited about this podcast because I really like taxes and like business and like figuring out how to save money and like learning about all this kind of stuff. I'm not super like knowledgeable on it. So I'm really excited to have you guys on and explain to everyone because I know a lot of my audience is like athletes and stuff. I'm sure most of them don't know how to do their taxes and yeah, it's I mean, very out of reach for most people just because, you know, you start talking about taxes and it's just a big turnoff because it's not something that's really easily taught to most people. Yeah, for sure. And I really enjoy it for some odd reason, but a lot of people don't. So um, let's see. First of all, like if you were like, let's say uh, you guys do taxes for like W-2s and 1099s and all that stuff, right? Correct. Yeah. And how long have you guys been doing this for? I've been doing it about six years now. Six yeah. years? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, you? I've been in doing taxes about eight years. Eight years? Okay. So did you guys work for a different company before you had your own business? Yeah. We both started off at uh, another CPA firm, a local one, and then uh, later we just got to know each other as coworkers and then eventually uh, just started to start this business. Sweet. And is this like all you guys do for work, is CPA stuff right now? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I'm trying to diversify, but this is the home base. Must be a good business to be in. You showed up in an NSX. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, look at that it's, car. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. How do you like the NSX? It's it's fun. You know, I really test drove a lot of different cars around that range, and it was a little bit more unique than some of the other cars. Yeah. So. It is a unique car. You showed up, and I was like, is this a McLaren? Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot. I mean, there's very few NSX that you're going to see around. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it performs well and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's probably one of the most fun cars I've ever driven. I would say so. Um, I, uh, anyways, back onto the taxes kind of stuff. So, um, f- so first, if you're to uh, like, I would like to help people out not to do their own taxes or anything because I think having a CPA do your taxes is probably the most beneficial thing someone can do, especially because you learn like before when I used to do my own taxes. I would always end up paying a bunch of money and I feel like I was never doing it correctly. And then I ended up getting audited once and it was like a nightmare. Have you guys ever been audited before? No, but we've worked with clients that have been and it's usually when then when they kind of just run wild with their expenses and things like that. And so that's what a CPA would help with and kind of see where to pull back on some expenses and uh, not get too crazy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's probably mostly like business owners and that kind of stuff that get audited. Like you're probably not going to get audited if you have all W-2s, right? Typically, no. It's more so just business owners or sole proprietors, Schedule C type of filers. Okay. So is there more than uh, two different forms you can get? So there's a 1099, which is like a self-employed kind of thing. And then there's a W-2. Is there other ones as well? Uh, They would be... More for like passive income, like dividends, interest, like K-1s, things like that. As far as earned income, uh, it would just be limited to wages and uh, like the 1099s. Okay. So can you guys kind of explain to the audience like uh, what the difference between a 1099 and a W-2 is? Yeah, of course. So a W-2 is basically you're working for someone else you are their employee you follow a schedule and that's kind of your day job and a 1099 means more so you are free to set your own schedule and kind of do whatever you need to do to earn that money and you don't necessarily have a boss you might have clients or companies that you deal with but they don't necessarily tell you you need to be here between eight and five every day yeah yeah for sure um, I've only had 1099s for the last like four years, so I've never, I haven't gotten taxes back in a while, but, uh, fortunately I've, uh, ne- 
I haven't really paid anything. And a lot of times when I tell people like, oh, I haven't paid anything in taxes in three years, they're like, that's like, you're a criminal. Like you're just like <laughs> Donald Trump. And I'm like, well, I mean, like if you guys understood how taxes work, then uh, you probably save some money, if not make some back. Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest difference is obviously as a employee of a company, you naturally also have expenses. You know, you have a cell phone, you're driving to work, you're doing this and that to really go and do your job. And when you're a 1099, you still have those expenses, but then you have all these other, you know, you could have insurance and other things that are going to be expenses for your 1099 income and all that stuff becomes deductible. So yep. that is the benefit of being a 1099. There's obviously the downside of you don't have an employer saving and paying your taxes on your behalf. So you need to be a little bit more cognizant as you're earning income so that you don't get caught in that hole, especially starting out. Yeah. So what would be some advice for someone who's like uh, just starting out as like a, like when I'm doing taxes i'm kind of thinking about taxes all year round like whenever i get a big paycheck i'm like oh i better invest some of this like as it comes in rather than just like at the end of the year like uh oh like i'm gonna have all these taxes i gotta pay i kind of think about it year round would you say that's like a good strategy for someone who's like an athlete or something yeah definitely i mean the best thing you can do is honestly to talk to a professional uh whether that's a manager a cpa a lawyer someone to really first get you on the right track and then from there you know just doing it on a monthly basis so you always kind of know where you're at income and expense wise will be the most beneficial thing well what a lot of people get caught up in is they wait till the last minute and at that point there's not a lot you can do to really recover from that yeah for sure and uh so i'm assuming you guys do your own taxes then right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you guys ever had any bad experiences doing other people's taxes and that kind of stuff? I mean, there's a variety. Um, sometimes there's really messy taxes. Other times they're really clean. Uh, but just to piggy piggyback off what Julian said, I think just keeping in mind how much income you're earning throughout the year, especially if you are a contractor and you are getting gigs, just getting to know like, maybe around September, knowing how about how much you're going to earn, then you can kind of gauge, a, um, kind of plan for, for the taxes that way. Yeah, definitely. So what are some business write-offs that we can name to like the athlete or acrobat that is watching this? Uh, definitely your, like your training fees. Training like fees, gyms. like if you go to a gym, right? Absolutely. Um, gas, of course, right, is one. Gas, telephone, uh, and home office. Mm -hmm. And also any management fees if they have anything like that. And uh, definitely an auto. You can either take mileage or you can write off your vehicle, depending which is more beneficial for you. Yeah, so I've always driven around like 30,000 miles a year. And most of it is, it's like, probably 90 percent for my business so that usually takes care of like a good chunk of like the taxes that i would usually owe and like again like i've always gone to h and r block but it was just so expensive and like i don't know i just felt like the guy the last person that did my taxes was just like they had so many people coming in they didn't really care too much compared to the person who did it before that's when i was like hey does anyone know a good tax guy and then i forget who it was that referred you but i mean like I didn't end up paying anything in taxes, so I'm happy. Oh, and yeah. like, I feel like I always learn a little bit from having someone else do my taxes. Cause like just the other day I ran into a friend and they're like doing their turbo tax thing. And they're like, I owe so much money on uh, taxes. And I'm like, you should probably just take, instead of paying that like $2,000 that you owe, you should just pay a CPA to do it, learn some stuff. And then you'll probably get a lot of money back not back unless you have a lot of w-2s but i mean it's always a better investment i think yeah i just recently actually had this conversation with a client and that you know back in the day cpa was kind of a luxury type of thing you know h and r block jackson hewitt those kind of places were for the average taxpayer to go to you know that's kind of where you went and you know upper middle class to high income typically had a cpa tax attorney such and such to handle it but nowadays it's really come down to where if you're a gig worker, you probably should have a CPA. The problem with H&R Block or TurboTax is, you know, 
it's like going to Costco. They're going to get you in and out and mm-hmm. everyone's going to get the same level of service. And that person's not going to help you strategize year over year on where to really save money or how to prepare for retirement or things along those lines. So, you know, initially it might cost a little bit more, but in the long run it ends up being a lot more beneficial than just having someone plug and chug your stuff every year. Yeah, yeah. And so what's your business called for anyone who's looking to get their taxes done? Valor CPAs. Valor CPAs? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And it's just you two right now? Yep, just us. Nice. So uh, I'm, this might be a touchy subject for some people, but can you guys explain how Donald Trump might have only paid $750 in taxes? Because when I heard that, I was like, yeah, of course, <laughs> duh. Why would he pay more? <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it, and a lot of it may just be the way that all of his business are structured, to be honest, because most people would just think, you know, they're earning, they're getting a W-2, and they're getting a wage, and then they have to pay their taxes that way, but I'm sure at at his level, at being an owner, he's owned multiple businesses, he probably, not sure if he issues himself a W-2 or not, but he's got more than enough businesses to roll his business losses into against his income yeah i think what most people don't realize it kind of goes with you know back to the president and corporations such as amazon is that um when you start a new business typically you're going to have tons of expenses and in the president's case he also had real estate and all these other investments that he had and you know when you are that kind of level of investor or business owner if something goes bankrupt It means you could have potentially lost millions of dollars, which is going to be used in the future to offset any income that you earn. So if he had lost $10 million two years ago and he earns $10 million two years later, it nets out to zero and Mm -hmm. he doesn't have to pay taxes. And that's the biggest discrepancy. You know, the average taxpayer is not going to realize compared to a business owner or investor is that there's going to be expenses that roll year after year until eventually they get used up. Um, in this case, obviously, there were some massive losses that he incurred back in the 80s and 90s, which have been continuously going. And also, you know, there's just different types of income. There's passive income, there's long-term capital gains, there's ordinary income, all taxed at different rates, all being offset by different things, which is how you kind of reduce your taxes. Um, you know, a lot of people think of it as cheating, but that's kind of how the tax code's currently structured. And that's yeah. why it's really beneficial to uh, get with a professional for your own self if you're a gig worker, a business owner, so that you are also trying to optimize your deductions and making sure that you're reducing your tax liability. Yeah. Yeah. For example, uh, three years ago when I started off axis, I did my own taxes at first and it said I owed like. I think it was like eight thousand dollars or something like that and i was like oh shit i'm gonna go to h&r block and make sure that this is right and i ended up owing nothing because i didn't realize like all the things that i could write off and yep. then he was explaining it to me and the first guy that i went to at h&r block was amazing he spent a lot of time on my taxes mm-hmm. but he ended up retiring um like for example one thing that has re- like really helped and like i didn't realize that you can write off things over a period of time if it's a gigantic like for example i bought a trampoline which is a little bit over $10,000 mm-hmm. and we wrote that off over a three year period rather than just um, write it all off at once. Of course. Yeah. Um, how were my taxes to do? Were they harder? No, uh, extremely easy. And again, yeah. like you said, like you have vehicles and things like that, that can be expensed over time or essentially depreciated. Mm-hmm. And that's also sometimes a tax, I guess a strategy or incentive that we would suggest to clients, like if you did have enough income and you were looking to purchase a new vehicle, instead of expensing it over five years, you can actually take the entire expense in that year and lower your taxable income and then lower your tax liability. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, so is it, would you say it's easier to do uh, taxes for a business, like when you get a K-1 or something, or do you think it's easier to do like for single people? It's about the same, honestly. I mean, obviously, a W-2 tax return is going to be the easiest because the taxes are already paid. Um, But sometimes, you know, business owners are very organized and it's just as easy. It just really, the problem happens when people kind of get disorganized or behind and they have to start putting their records together. But if you stay on track and, you know, do it on a monthly or quarterly basis, whatever is going to work for you, 
it'll be just as easy as if you were employed by a company at the end of the time period. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed when we started an LLC, we had to start doing quarterly taxes and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. Like <laughs> I have to do taxes four times a year now. But uh, we ended up switching to a, uh, not a sole proprietorship. It's an S-Corp? S-Corp. That's what we switched to because I don't believe we have to do it every four four times a year. Or do you? So you still have to make your quarterly estimated tax payments. Where you benefit doing an S-Corp is you'll run payroll. So you'll still be paying in payroll taxes throughout the year. Whereas if you're a sole proprietor or in a partnership, you really won't be paying any taxes throughout the year, and that's when you really want to get on those quarterly payments after a certain amount of income. Yeah, so do you guys have an LLC? Is that the one that you guys took? Yeah, we do. An LLC? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I usually let my business partner handle all that kind of stuff. I kind of do all the marketing and like the fun stuff, I guess. But uh, so let's see, what else can we talk about? Um, so when you get... So you guys have been doing this for quite a while, right? And uh, is it like, do you guys get taxes year round or is it just all at once? It There's a big rush, obviously, throughout the first four months. Um, after that, it becomes more like complex taxes, investors or business owners that just want to wait. Mm. Um, typically, there's going to be another big rush around August, early September, really to finish up those business taxes and individual returns. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's pretty much taxes year round because then there's, you know, the population that just is behind on their taxes. So they end up coming in like December. Hey, I haven't filed taxes for three years. Can you help me? Yeah. And you can get pretty screwed over by the IRS if you don't pay your taxes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, not to call out any of my friends, but I know someone who was like getting called by the IRS like almost on a weekly basis. And then they went to their employer and was like, hey, you can't pay this guy anymore. You have to pay us. Yeah. So definitely the IRS has since they passed that new tax law in 2017 that went effective for 2018. They have a lot more ways of collecting taxes. So, yeah, if you are behind on your taxes, they're starting to use private collection agencies and they're issuing levies a lot quicker. So, you know, if you own a home and you owe taxes, they can levy it. And if you ever try to refinance it or sell your house, you're going to have to pay the IRS before you can do anything. Mm. And if you're working for somebody and you also have your own business, if you're behind on your taxes, they're going to garnish your wages. If you're receiving any refunds, they're going to garnish that. You know, they just have a lot more ways now to really get the money that they're owed. Yeah, for sure. That's something I do not want is the IRS on my back. No, that's yeah, the last people you want. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I do kind of tend to t like wait until the last minute because I'm like, oh, I don't want to. I always go through my uh, at the end of the year, I just go through my checking account and look at all the expenses. Is that legal or do you need all your receipts? So technically by the books, by the books, you need all your receipts. Yeah. More so for like the larger purchases. Obviously, if we're talking like fifty dollar dinner, that's not that big of a deal. But um, you know, I've also seen it go the other way, and they didn't really ask for receipts. It just depends on how much you're really spending. So I would always try to keep receipts on anything big, you know, a couple hundred dollars or more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, whenever I buy things, especially like electronics, I always go to Best Buy because they keep all the receipts mm -hmm. so if i ever need to, <laughs> i always think like if i'm gonna get audited or something i'm just gonna go to best buy and have them print out every receipt that i got yeah definitely or i think amazon that is that you know electronics have made it a lot easier to keep track of you know receipts and stuff like that i think the only thing i would suggest for most people is saving like their credit card statements and oh, bank yeah. statements Especially mm -hmm. if you write checks, to make sure you have the check images. Because what I've seen happen is their bank account gets closed or they close their credit card and the IRS comes knocking three years later and does an audit. And you're, they're like, I need to see statements. I need to see check images. Mm -hmm. You don't have it. You go to the bank or the credit card company and they start charging you for you know, copies of the statements. And if you don't have check images and they need to print it, I think it's like 5 to $7 a check image which can rack up if you wrote a lot of checks. So that's something, you know, I try to get my business owners to do is really start saving their statements at least. You don't need to do anything with it, but, you know, add it to Google Drive, Dropbox, whatever you're using just to have it there. Yeah. 
Whew. Yeah, that would uh, suck. <laughs> so how long can it be that they can, like, how much later can they audit you? Do you know? Uh, they have three years from the data filing. So let's say this year's taxes are due in April of next year. They have three years from that April to audit that year. Um, if you've never filed taxes for a period of time, they can always go back. And if they discover fraud during an audit, then they can also go back a lot further. Oof. That, <laughs> <laughs> that is scary. Hopefully they don't come after me. But I think uh, I think mine are pretty, pretty safe. They usually just go after people with like large amounts of money mostly, right? Well, actually... Um, Say a large uh -oh. amount of expenses... That would be the biggest red flag. Yeah, large of expenses or just losing money every year. But there was something that recently came out that they do prefer going after like smaller people or businesses because you're more likely to, it's low hanging fruit. You yeah. Know? Whereas if you go after like a billionaire, they already have a team of people that are going to make it a lot harder and it's going to take you a lot more time to really finally get a tax bill. Whereas if you go, to a local business and you audit them you know they don't have the funds to really have a team of lawyers and accountants defend them so they're yep. gonna try to negotiate a balance and so that's you know the scary part but honestly if you're using a professional or you have some kind of experience you know most people should be fine it's just a matter of record keeping that's where people get you know caught up is they just don't have the records yeah for sure so, and how much do you guys typically charge to do someone's taxes? Does it vary depending on what kind of taxes they have? Yeah, it could, you know, it could be a couple hundred dollars and it could be a couple thousand dollars. It really just depends on what you have going on, you know. Um, we try to work with our clients to fit their budget. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're not kind of like a nature in our block where you know, we're going to have people come in and we're just going to charge them the same mm -hmm. and we're not going to like help them. We want our clients to get something out of the interaction so they understand what their taxes are, why their taxes are that way. And so that next year they can actually, you know, prepare the data better so that they're paying less to us and a little bit, you know, more knowledgeable on doing taxes every year. Yeah. And then, so I'm assuming you guys have a lot of returning customers, right? Yes. Yeah, because even though like I, I could do my taxes on my own now and I'm pretty well versed on how it works, like I still want someone else to do my taxes because I want it to be as legit as possible. And I feel like I'm less likely to get audited if someone else does my taxes and they look perfect rather than like if I do it and I'm like, oh, I don't know, just group them all into one thing or something, you know? Yeah, you know, it, it um, it's always beneficial to have someone do something else for you if possible uh especially like taxes or like you know if you're a handy person you still probably want someone else to come fix your roof sometimes just yeah. because that liability gets shifted on to the contractor mm -hmm. taxes are kind of the same way if you pay a professional to do your taxes they're going to be a little bit more liable on making sure your taxes are correct and being ready to defend you in case of an audit or anything else yeah yeah for sure um so Let's see. What would be like some suggestions for anyone out there who's just becoming like a entrepreneur or a business owner or something? Like how can they go about like the whole year and like save money on taxes? Let's say structuring would be one of the biggest things. So a lot of entrepreneurs, they just think, I just want to get a 1099 and I earn this income. But when the time comes, they would just think... I'm going to just file a Schedule C, and but then they end up paying a bunch of tax on it. So setting up an LLC with the state and then thinking about the structure, on such as you setting up an S-Corp or if you are setting up an LLC like a partnership, those things will matter in the long run because those will actually help you save. That's where the tax savings are. Yeah, you know, honestly, everyone wants to work for themselves to some kind of capacity. And really, at the beginning, before you even do that, you really need to think, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to keep myself honest and on track mm -hmm. so that throughout the year you're actually following that? Because you know, that's the biggest temptation, right? It's kind of like when your parents stop being in charge of you, you kind of can go off the wall very quickly. And mm -hmm. when you're earning income um, as a business owner, it's a lot scarier because no one's telling you what full tax is. So... 
Uh, you know, what we saw this year, especially with the pandemic, is that business owners have earned income, but then it has to go out just as much, but they still have to pay their taxes. So then they end up behind because of everything going on. And yeah, that's a very common situation, pandemic or not, where business owners spend the cash just as fast as it's coming in without paying taxes. Yeah. So, uh, like, if you guys had the choice, would you rather get a W-2 or a 1099? <laughs> <laughs> A 1099. <laughs> yeah, I prefer to, you know, wake up when I want to wake up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then you also have, like, you can do whatever you kind of want with your taxes, right? Correct. I mean, not, like, whatever you want, but... You're more flexible in the deductions you take. So, you know, if you are making 50000 a year as a W-2 employee or 50000 a year as your own, empo- your own uh, person, um, you know, you might be able to write off. 15,000 or so of expense, which puts you at making 35,000, which would be mm-hmm. compared to a W-2 at 35,000. So you're going to be paying a little bit less tax. The only thing is that you need to remember to pay that tax. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so every state is different. Do you guys do taxes in different states or just Nevada? Yeah, we could do it every state. Every state? Yep. Is it, uh, what's the most, like, what's the hardest state to do them in? Which one's the most complex? California, New York? Uh, those two, I'd say. Those two are probably the most uh, hard to deal with. Um, New York especially, you don't want to have any issues in New York. They just take very long to get back to you. And then California is just its own little beast. Yeah. So are you guys from Nevada? I'm from California. I moved to Nevada six years ago. Six years ago? Yeah. And we're... Uh, I grew up in California, but I've been out here since my elementary school. What part are you guys from? Um, I'm in like Inland Empire, Walnut, uh, Roland Heights area. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm from Arcadia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Moved here three years ago. And uh, so what is the difference between taxes in California and Nevada? Like what's the difference in percentage at least? So... In Nevada, we don't have a personal income tax, Mm -hmm. Um, whereas in California, there's personal income tax, which can be up to, I believe, 11% of your income. So, you know, you already owe the IRS, you know, call it 15, 20%, and then you tack on another 10% to California. That's going to impact your bottom line. Um, And then out there, they just have other business taxes depending what you're doing. Whereas Nevada, we don't have any business or personal income tax. So that's kind of why you see a lot of people moving to Nevada and establishing residency out here. Uh, A good portion of my athlete base try to get a primary residence either in Nevada or like a Florida, a place that there is no state income tax just so you can get on tax. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge one. I didn't even real when I moved to Nevada. I didn't even realize that the tax laws and stuff was so much better here. And then I was like, "Oh my god, thank God!" Because like, <laughs> I was always wondering why like I paid so much in taxes back when I lived in California, and then I moved here. I'm like, "Huh, paying less this year." Yep. So like, California is like a 54 percent tax rate or something like that. No, the, so I think the what happens is that when you see these infographics online that your taxes are like 50, 60 percent. They take into account federal taxes. They add on your state income tax. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of places also add on like the state sales tax and property tax so that they say like you're paying X amount. But, you know, I think the statistics show that more than half of taxpayers actually don't pay income tax. Mm -hmm. They typically get a refund. And I think there's some confusion in that there is income tax, which is your federal withholdings, and then there's your Social Security and Medicare taxes. Those two, yeah, you're kind of on the hook for that, and everyone pays that up until about 120000 of income. Um, But for the most part, you know, if you look at your taxes, you really need to see what you're getting back versus what you pay to actually see if you're paying taxes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, So let's see. What? Do you, are you guys allowed to talk about what athletes you guys do taxes for? Or? Uh, not technically. <laughs> no? Okay. I, I know some athletes, so I'm going to send some your way, though. Um, let's see. So a couple years ago, I had 
taxes or I had a I had to file taxes in multiple different states yep. and countries. I'm sure when you guys see that, you're like, oh, this is gonna be a headache, right? It's because my bit. tax guy was like, oh, <laughs> three countries and uh, and like four states. Like, oh god, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> It depends, right? Um, I think the biggest headache I've had with my professional athletes are the ones that are uh, playing pro ball because Mm. they're actually getting their stuff reported on the W-2. And you would think, you know, a billion-dollar organization would be able to accurately report their wages on there. And that's not the case. So then you have back and forth with all these various state agencies on this is actually wrong. This is how much I need to be paying taxes. And then once you add international on that, you know, it's it's a challenge. Mm. I, I had a uh, pro baseball player play in South Korea, and they th- changed their tax law, and they made it retroactive. So <laughs> oh. imagine paying your taxes and thinking you're fine, coming back to the States, and then another country's like, hey, actually, you owe me more taxes because we had a change in tax law. And it's kind of hard because he paid that those taxes, and now we're arguing with the IRS that, he is owed money back from the IRS because now his taxes were paid a lot higher in South Korea. Uh, so if you're a, let's say you're a pro baseball player and you, obviously they travel a lot, like they probably travel to like 20 different states. Yep. Are they, do they have to pay each of those states because they played a game there and they got paid? So every state has like a different minimum. Some states are like if you earn $4,000 or below, you don't have to file and some places are like 10000 For the most part, yeah, you have to file a tax return in every state that you earn income. Whew. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. It's a challenge, especially when um, you receive a bonus and they incorrectly allocate the bonus to the wrong state. Or if there's any issue where something is off, it's just very hard to get multiple states to agree on something. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So let's see. Um, so does the so when I went to H and R Block, they would charge me. I think it was like seventy five to a hundred dollars or something per ten ninety nine that I got, and then a certain rate on top of like for W twos, and like I would end up paying over a thousand dollars to H and R Block, and I was like, so do you guys would you guys increase per like ten ninety nine? Is that like a big deal? Does it make it more work for you guys? It would be more like what type of forms you actually have to file. So mm. say you start off with a W-2, then you'd only be, I don't know, like we'll charge 300. But then say you have a Schedule C and you have 10, 1099s. Well, then you're doing a Schedule C, so we'll add on an extra 150 to 200, something along those lines like that. So we wouldn't be counting by 1099. It'd be more of how much work we're doing for each form. So if you have your own business or your own rental properties that's how we would gauge on how to quote the taxes yeah definitely i think that's a older style of billing that i know some other firms do they charge by the form um no i mean we just believe that you know if you have everything organized it's going to be the same amount of work you know if you have 10 1099s they're all for ten thousand dollars it's going to go to the same amount at the end of the day um so you know we don't believe in that we try to do more value-based pricing yeah yeah, because when you told me your price, I was like, oh, that's so cheap. <laughs> like I went from getting quoted, I think it was like $1,300 at H&R Block, and then you told me 300 and I was like, I got to pay him more. Like I have to. <laughs> like almost like, is he not going to do him right or something? But <laughs> Well, it actually just helped because you had all your stuff organized. Yeah, That yeah. was like the biggest thing. So if the clients have all of their expenses laid out and – um, you were really quick to respond, so we had everything ready to go. And just for us, we're pretty efficient, so it was just easy to work on the taxes. Yeah. And so how long can people delay their taxes for? Because you can ask for an extension. How long can you extend for? The typical deadline is in April, and that can be extended to October. So October 15th is the last possible cutoff for the year. Um Obviously, some clients will just still forget afterwards, but we do our best just to remind them. Got it. I would caveat that um, you can delay filing your taxes. You can't delay paying your taxes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
you know, if you want to push it off, that's fine. But typically the IRS still expects their payment April 15th. And that's kind of why you want to have a professional or someone making sure you're at least doing quarterly deposits or you kind of know how much you're going to owe around then so you can pay it. Otherwise, they'll start charging you penalties and interest and not everyone likes to pay money that they don't want to have to pay. Yeah, for sure. So do you guys do like, uh, like let's say, for example, off axis since we do quarterly filing and stuff do you guys do like membership deals or something to where like oh we just pay you 50 bucks a month or something like that yeah definitely we have monthly consulting engagements with a various amount of clients okay is that expensive like how much would that cost no i mean it really just depends on what they're expecting um if there's no like bookkeeping or anything it might be a like consultation a month 100 200 dollars a month um if there's bookkeeping then it could be you know 500 and up a month but that also includes your books being reconciled and then you getting a profit and loss and balance sheet, which for um, our athletes that are making a lot of money, it's a lot of benefit, a bigger benefit. So they know where they are on a monthly basis. And um, it just helps to have that for financing or anything that you need. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another question I had, do you have to pay uh, taxes on unemployment money that comes in? Yes. Yes. So, for example, like let's say I made ten thousand dollars on unemployment this year. Um, I know there's two different ways that you can get unemployment, and that is if you are a W two worker. There's one, mm-hmm. and then there's the new one that was like, uh, if you're uh, self employed, mm-hmm. you get that one. So you have to pay taxes on both of those. You'll still pay taxes on both of those. You're going to pay federal income taxes, but not the payroll taxes because it wasn't payroll related technically because mm-hmm. it's unemployment. But yeah, that's, I think, the biggest thing people are going to get caught on this year. If they didn't have taxes withheld, you know, you didn't work, you really need the money for living expenses. And depending how much you got, you may owe, you know, 10, 15% of that money back. Got it. Okay. So let's say um, one thing that I heard recently was that uh, like a lot of big business owners, they'll like, Like if they're making millions and millions of dollars, they'll like buy an airplane one year and then they'll write it off for like the next three years and they get it out their taxes. They don't have to pay anything. (laughs) And then they'll just get a better airplane in three more years. And like, so is this all legal that you can do? To a degree. To To a degree. I I mean, I have some clients that do that, not to like airplane degree, but vehicles. um, Yeah, like luxury vehicles, big trucks, things like that. It ends up catching you if you ever sell the vehicle so yeah um you can start with like a ten thousand dollar vehicle depreciate it and then next year buy a twenty thousand dollar vehicle you're gonna have another ten thousand to write off and you can cascade it that way eventually if you sell it you have zero basis which is you know what it's worth to you at that point because you wrote it off so anything that you sell above zero you have to pay taxes on got it so yeah because i always uh i'm like uh so how many years can you go without paying taxes before they really are going to like catch on to you? I mean, you, theoretically, you could never pay tax, I guess, if your income and your expenses always net out to about zero minus like itemized deductions and stuff along those lines. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you could theoretically never pay tax or, you know, they might come back and be like, actually, I think you owe tax because of this. And then you just have to defend your position. But I mean, mm. you could theoretically pay no tax. Wow, that's crazy. Um, yeah, because my tax guy told me like three years ago, he's like, oh, don't do this for more than three years. Otherwise, they're going to catch you. Yeah, so they're, that comes on like the hobby rules. So, you know, a lot of people start like businesses and they try to do it for a couple of years while working a job and they lose money every year. Um, typically, you want to only have three years of losses out of the last five years. Mm. Otherwise, they're going to say, this is a hobby. You're not really trying to start a business and they can make you pay taxes on those years. Yeah, because I've started like three businesses in the last four years. So like I'm probably safe for a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all the intent, right? If you're like, I kind of want to do an Etsy shop and I went out and spent like 5000 on stuff for Etsy and you're just writing off expenses every year because you haven't really put forth the effort to like build revenue. That's one thing. But if you're actually like trying to like run the business and you're just not getting sales, that's a whole different thing. Got it. Okay. So that answers most of my questions. Is there any other info that 
you guys think we should tell the audience? Um, I would say just with the way the pandemic has affected everyone this year, it's a good time to really reevaluate what you're doing for your business structure and making sure that you have everything together so that going into 2021, you're prepared to file your taxes and also you're ready if there's any kind of stimulus for small business. Because I think that's what a lot of people missed out in in 2020 was that they either always wrote everything off so they weren't eligible for like a ppp type of thing or they just didn't have their financials together so they couldn't apply for the eidl from the sba and you know it sucks if you're in that kind of position because you know you're hurting as an athlete and you could have had this money but for whatever reason you're either too aggressive or you just weren't prepared and the window closes yeah it's i think it's so important that people at least it's so weird that we don't learn this stuff in school at all. Like it took me until I was like 26 years old to learn anything about how taxes worked. Yeah. It's uh, you know, they're really trying to push people to get more knowledgeable about it now, but they're going to teach you how to be like a W2 employee and file taxes that way. They're not going to be like, this is how you become a business owner. And that's the benefit, I guess, of having the internet now is that, there are some resources for people to go out there and get that cursory knowledge, but also, you know, reaching out to someone else like a mentor or a professional to get a little bit more clarity on some questions. Yeah. Okay. So one last question. So like, is it as simple as like, let's say I make a hundred dollars one year and in my state it's a 40% tax rate. If I spend or if I invest $40 into my business, Am I good? Negative? Uh, you're saying like having $40 of like expenses? Yeah, like let's say a profit $100 mm-hmm. and then I got to pay $100 in that taxes, but I write off $40. Mm-hmm. So you have taxes. 60 net. 60 net and yeah. then I'm good, zero. I'm going to pay zero. No. no. No? No, no, Is it more complex than that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit more complex than just direct write off like that. Sweet. Yeah, because okay. you would have to take into account your other income and then also your your tax rate, things like that. Yeah, the we don't have like a flat tax rate either, so um, it's going to ramp up different levels. So it'll start at 0, 10, 15, 18, 22, and then go up that way. So it might not, but I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, if you kind of are spending business expense wise, what you're making income wise, it, if it nets out to zero, you're not going to owe tax. Got it. Cool. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. But uh, thank you guys for coming on. I feel like we are going to help someone out with this video. <laughs> hopefully. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, so. if you guys uh, don't already have an amazing tax person, you guys should. What is your guys' business called again? Valor CPAs. Valor CPAs. Contact Valor CPAs. It, you guys have a website? Yeah, valorcpas.com. How do you spell Valor? V A L O R C P A S dot com. And our phone number is 702 475 4368. Again, highly recommended. Um, yeah, and then it's Julian and William. Thank you guys for coming on. Oh, really for appreciate it. Us. Thank you. I was super excited about this. Um, And thank you guys for watching. Subscribe if you guys have not. And we'll see you in the next one. Peace.